All right, good morning. We are continuing our study in A Life Beyond Amazing. We are on Lesson 10, which is a life of self-discipline. And we're going to start uh, the upper part of page 104. The building blocks to a disciplined life. Now, last week I introduced that, saying that we're, there were five building blocks. So this morning we're going to see how much we can uh, partake of in God's Word. So the very first thing it's telling us this morning is to embrace your dissatisfactions. Are there things in your life that you're dissatisfied with? <coughs> Excuse me. Are there things in your life that you are dissatisfied with? I don't want to brace my dissatisfaction. I want them as far removed from me as they can possibly be. That is not always the case. So let's find out why in the world would we want to even visit anything called a dissatisfaction. But the Apostle Paul real recognized he had not accomplished his goal of following Christ as completely as he wanted. Now, I would have to say we may not be as called to be as diligent as what Paul's calling was. I know that I have a calling. I know y'all have a calling. But it may not be to the level that Paul's calling was. So he had this goal of ministry that he wanted to keep up. Now I have a goal in my ministry. I'm sure you have a goal in your ministry or whatever. And I do try to to keep that up, certain duties that I have to perform for God's house, I really try to keep them up. And um, there are times like this morning that sometimes life gets in the way, and we know what our priorities are, but we have to make concessions. Now, I wasn't dissatisfied this morning that I was running late, but I had to be honest and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. So things like that works out. But Paul wanted to do more. The more he accomplished, the more he wanted to do. To do. And he used his death satisfactions to spur him on. Now, okay, so if we're going to visit dissatisfaction, I will say that when I sit in the church this morning, there are a few things in the church that I am dissatisfied with. We have a window that was broken years ago that is on schedule to be fixed. I wish it had been fixed years ago, but it has now gotten to the point that it has to be fixed. We had a leak in the attic from an air conditioning unit. It is past time for that to be fixed. If I can go home and live in a nice house, why am I allowing God's house to have things that need to be done. We have a light that needs to be taken care of in the kitchen. There are three major things that need to be done. Yes, the church is clean. Praise God for that. Yes, the church grounds are beautiful. Praise God for that. People have certain jobs and positions that they're keeping up with, and that's wonderful. But every once in a while, something out of the ordinary comes along that we need to take care of. So it is my prayer, and I ask y'all to pray, that we're able to get these things done. In fact, I have put them on a schedule, and hopefully they're going to both, all three of those things will be done by the end of September. So in other words, maybe I should have put my foot down six months ago, okay? But, you know, it wasn't my place to really put my foot down. I understand that people busy and with the world we're living in we all have things going on you know Ryan's just back from the loss of his mother-in-law that was a time consuming thing that took him away from the church sometimes we have illness we have sickness or we have responsibility family responsibilities you know Frank and I we have a business we have a working farm we are very busy but on the other hand there are certain things that God requires of us. So when it comes to being dissatisfied, that's the dissatisfaction that I would see. 
that the Holy Spirit would spur us on to do more and to do better and to allow us in God's time to get things done. So in other words, what I'm going to have to say is when these things get done, I'm going to thank God that they got done in His time and not our time instead of bellyaching and complaining, which I can't do. So anyhow, <laughs> let's continue on with embracing our dissatisfactions. We need to enlist our dissatisfactions to drive us toward great self-control for Christ. I could have warned everybody out about that, about some of the things that needed to be done in the church. But for people that walk in the church, they really don't see those things. They don't see them. They don't notice them. I mean, it's not like, ooh, those people need to replace a window. It's not those types of things. I mean, for the most part, our church is absolutely gorgeous. And really and truthfully, the focus doesn't need to be on the building. The focus needs to be on the heart of the people, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They might be empowered by the Holy Spirit. They might feel the love of the Holy Spirit and feel the love and the fellowship that is here in this church. Now, we will never see the need for the rigors of self-discipline if we think we've arrived. I know it all. I don't need anything else. Regardless of the area of life we're talking about, only those who want more will subject themselves to the demands of self-control. We've got to control ourselves. We need to control our mouth. We need to control our thoughts. Has your thoughts ever gotten out of control? Has there ever been a battlefield of the mind? Have you ever thought something so utterly stupid or something so utterly mean or something so utterly evil? If you haven't, then you're not alive because the devil puts foolishness in our minds. So we have to control our minds. We have to control our mouths. We have to control our bodies. And we can only do this through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the salvation of Jesus Christ. So now, let's talk about good intentions. What are your good intentions? Well, it's my good intention to do certain things in the church. But sometimes I forget something that I've done every month. This last month, I confess, I forgot to pay the electric bill. Oh, no, they didn't cut the electric bill off. I paid it, but I didn't pay it when it was supposed to be paid because we got a new bill from that very same company and when I went on the telephone to pay it, I thought I had paid both of them, and I only paid one of them. Okay? I had to put in $3 more because I made a mistake. Okay? But I'm not going to cover it up. It will be on the financial records for everybody to see that Brenda got caught up or forgot or didn't handle it correctly. Whatever. None of us are perfect. And the reason we're not perfect is because we need Jesus, and we need that. So my intentions are good, my heart is good, but sometimes the flesh makes mistakes, and the flesh fails. Those things happen. So beware of those good intentions. It's easier to think that wanting to do better is the same as is doing better. So in other words, if my intentions are good, I need to put feet to those intentions. I need to get those intentions taken care of. But in Proverbs chapter 12, verses 11 and then 28 and 19, it said, they warn against living in a fantasy world. We do not live in a perfect world. Help us, Jesus. But you turn on the, on the news and you know that our world is not perfect. Okay? Satan is running the worldly system through the fleshly minds of the unsaved. Even there are those that are saved that do not understand what is going on in the world around us today. Satan has, has got so many people under his thumb and out of their ignorance and stupidity, they are destroying the world. Not just our nation, but destroying the world. If you watch the news, you look at things and common sense, praise God for wisdom and common sense, tells you that's wrong. You look at things that are going on all across this world and things that are going on are wrong and they are devised by Satan. There's so many things now that society accepts as normal that according to the word of God is not normal. And why is that? 
because people are not studying the Word of God. They're not having the indwelling of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in them. They don't know any better. They accept what they're told, they accept what they see, and they say, well, that's just the way it is. But when you bump these things up against the Word of God, you know Satan is maneuvering through all types of people in this world. It's not just politicians, it's preachers, it's lawyers. How many times do you try to watch the news and everything is an injury lawyer? People want to sue people for everything. Everything. And the Bible tells you that you're not supposed to do that. They're making millions of dollars off of ignorant people who want to sue other people for an accident. What is an accident? Yeah, for fair day. That's exactly right. It is awful. Okay? So... Such a person is devoid of understanding if you think you know it all, and you know what? Things are not going to end well for you. He goes on to talk about that there was a poet who, had, who was tragically undisciplined. He had these great ideas, but he would not follow through. He had all of this education, but he wouldn't finish it. He had all of these talents, but he wouldn't put it to work. He just could not finish the task. Now, I don't know about y'all, I, I blame it on old age, but there's times that I'm working in the kitchen and I'm washing dishes and all of a sudden my mind skips and I leave the, have the dishes halfway done in the sink and I'm in the bedroom and I'm doing something else and all of a sudden I realize I got this to do. <clears throat> I'm in the office doing something else and the next thing I know I go back and I thought three hours later, I didn't finish washing my dishes. Those things happen to all of us. <clears throat> they happen to each and every one of us. Okay? So, at the bottom of page 105, it says, start working out. Be around spiritual people. Be around godly people. Reject worldly distractions and exercise yourself. The Word of God tells us that we need to guard the gate. You need to guard the gate of your heart. You need to guard the, guard the gate of your mind. And we need to lean towards godliness. I thought it was interesting that when I started restudying this lesson again this morning, that for two days, I did not finish my Bible study. Something came up Sunday. I had to get to church early. I didn't finish my personal time with God. Something came up yesterday. I didn't finish my personal time with God. Something came up today. I didn't finish my personal time with God. Okay. And I understand that that's something I've trained myself to do, but I need to get myself back in the habit of my personal time. Now, I did have personal time with God I, all of these three days, but I didn't get to finish what I had started. Now, Paul, when he's training Timothy, he tells Timothy to train himself to be godly. My morning spiritual time, prayer time, study time is a training that I have put myself through. But it takes spiritual growth and godliness. It's just like an athlete. If they want to go for the gold in the Olympics, they have to discipline themselves and they have to train and exercise and work at it daily. My walk with God is daily. It tells us in Philippians that we are to work out our own salvation and trembling. I cannot depend on Ryan to get me through with my salvation. I cannot depend on my pastor to get me through with my salvation. I answer directly to God, okay? God knows my weaknesses. I thank God for grace and mercy that I feel like I've failed over the last three days because I have not completed my studies. I have a certain amount of study I do every morning. And the reason is because, number one, I've been called to teach. I have to have the Word in me. 
I have to guard the gate. There are certain things that come on television I cannot watch. I will not put that in my mind. There are certain things that come across me to read I cannot read. I will not put that in my mind. I have to keep my mind clear or either that garbage, if I put it in me, it's going to spew out of me at some point in time. Okay? So that is how I've trained myself. Let me tell you, that's not an overnight training. That's years of training. Years of training. Okay? And it's gotten me to a, to a better point, but not like Paul, a complete point. Peter reminded his readers that they had all been given things, everything they needed to have a life and to be godly, including great and precious promises. Peter did not allow the people to rest on their spiritual inheritance. I have a grandmother who was a Pentecostal holiness minister. She never retired. She went to her grave. She was a church planner. She planted many churches all over the state of South Carolina. She is recognized in the Pentecostal Holiness Hall of Fame. <clears throat> and I've met several people who came up under her preaching. I'm not Pentecostal Holiness. Do I have holiness in me? Absolutely. But I'm not a Pentecostal Holiness. I'm not a Baptist. Some people think we're sitting in a Baptist church. I think we're sitting in a godly church. This is God's house. I'm not going to put a denomination or a title on myself anymore. I'm absolutely past that. Now, the thing that, that I want you to understand is that we need to train ourselves to be fit for God's service, okay? To be fit for God's service. Now, he tells them to be diligent to acquire faith. The only way that he know, that we know, thank you, Ryan, the only way that we know to acquire faith is to absorb the word, okay? Just like an athlete with training to build up their muscles, to build up their stamina, they have to work at it. So in order for us to build up our faith, we have to work at it. We have to be virtuous people, people with good morals. We have to have knowledge. We have to have knowledge of God's Word. Have you ever gotten in a conversation with somebody and you they were just talking about the Bible? And they were quoting things that you knew were not in the Bible. Their heart was good. They were trying to impress you. Because a lot of people know that I teach. Sometimes they try to impress me with their knowledge. Bless their hearts. I pray for them. And a lot of times they know what they're talking about. Or they're just getting into knowing what they're talking about. But sometimes their pride takes over and they want to impress me. Listen, I don't need to be impressed. I'm just as common as a flea hopping across the, the carpet. I, I'm no better than anybody else. I'm just called to do what God has called me to do. Even though it looks like the ministry is small, I have no idea how many people we reach. The only thing I know is God said, you be there, you teach it, and I'm going to bless it. Okay? So that's what we have to do, and that's what we have to be about. We have to exhibit self-control and perseverance. We cannot give up. The devil wants you to give up. Well, you know what? I, I'm going to go come this morning because there wasn't going to be nobody in the church but me and Ryan. I already had two people call and cancel this morning. Nobody's here today but me and Ryan. But Aunt Rose and Jennifer are on the phone. I don't know if there's someone else on the phone. I don't know if somebody's going to watch it by YouTube. I don't care. God said, you study, you teach, and I will provide the harvest. And that's exactly what he does because I'm faithful to listen. Brotherly kindness and love. The word diligent could be translated as to make every effort to do what God has called us to do. He wanted to make sure they understood the challenge of following Christ. Godliness does not happen easily. It does not happen automatically, and it does not happen overnight. It does not. It's something that I work at every day, and let me confess, there's some days that I fail miserably. But God loves me, and God keeps me going, and God has equipped me to do what he is called to do. We want to be like Christ, 
but it takes self-discipline to get there. There are certain things that God requires us to do, certain areas of service that he wants us to participate in, if it's nothing more than praying for the saints. So next week, we're going to get in talking back to your body, because your body can be your absolute worst enemy. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Your feet can take you places you have no business going. Your brain can take you places you have no business going. Your hands, your eyes. Lord Jesus, I know that sometimes there's things I see that I just don't want to see. Things I hear, I don't want to hear. Okay? But these are things that we're going to learn. So next week when we get here, we're going to be talking back to our body. Y'all think on that. Y'all pray on that. Remember that we're closing out this Bible study within the next month or so. We are looking for a new Bible study. I'm open to any suggestions, anything that anybody wants to stu study or hear. I'm open for it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name for your word that has encouraged us this morning, that has, has lifted us up, but, Father, your word that has let us know that we're flesh. We're going to make mistakes. There's times we're going to fail. But because of your grace and your love and your mercy, Father, we can be picked up, put back on a path of righteousness for your name's sake in order to do the things that you've called us to do. Each and every one of us have a calling on our lives. Father, I ask today that you would refresh that calling in Jesus' name, that you would bring those callings to mind, and that as a part of this lesson today, that we would be encouraged to do exactly what you've called us to do, and we'll give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.